you. Thank you, Mark. And uh, now we're going to hear from uh, Patrick O'Neill from the uh, Father Charlie Mulholland Catholic Worker in Garner, North Carolina. Um, as, as all of you know, our action happened in what is referred to as the Deep South. And in the Deep South, we're right on the Florida border, on the, uh, on the eastern shore of Georgia. Uh, there's a real remnant of slavery and the legacy of oppression, uh, chattel. It's, it's still there. It's, it's, it's still there and it's still very much alive and active there. So we went to this place where for 35 years, Trident submarines were floating in the harbor in St. Mary's, Georgia. And for the first time in 35 years, intruders came on this Navy base. And um, it, is, it has absolutely been shocking to the people there. There's, it's really very rare that I come across anybody down in South Georgia who, who really has a understanding politically or theologically of what the seven of us did and why we did it. And it's important to realize that what are you on? At first, I'm sort of frustrated that that uh, I'm, I'm frustrated that we're not getting a lot of support. But then I realize, well, that's the reason we need to be there. We need to be there because people aren't thinking or caring about this issue. And I'd like to tell one story. When the eight of us, when the seven of us were in the in the first jail we were in, when we were only facing state charges, um, someone asked the local priest in St. Mary's, Georgia, from the one Catholic church in that town to come see us in jail. So we had to segregate uh, by gender, but the four of us, the men, Carmen, Mark, Steve, and I, met this priest. He had a, he had a little Eucharistic service, gave us Holy Communion, prayed with us. And then I kind of thought, well, maybe he's just going to leave now, because I'd heard from one of the members of his parish that he'd already preached against us, having not met us. or And, and so... But the thing was, he, he was curious, and he said to us, you know, uh, your action has caused me some problems at my parish because people ask me, how can seven Catholics break into the sub-base and destroy government property and claim to be doing it in the name of Jesus? And he said, I don't know what to tell them. And that was the fascinating part. He didn't know what to tell them. But the good thing was, for 30 minutes, he listened to us. And Steve, a theologian, Steve Kelly, uh, kind of spoke in his, his, uh, his language, his theological language, and for 30 minutes he just listened to us. The only uh, disclaimer he had was in the middle of the whole thing. He just said, I don't even believe in guns. But he listened very carefully, and remarkably, 30 minutes later, he completely understood us theologically and politically. Not that he necessarily joined our, our support group or anything like that. In fact, we never heard from him again. I, I sent him emails and didn't hear from him. But the point was that he did get it. But of course, we don't have time to speak to all the people in South Georgia and elsewhere about, about the motivations of our action. A lot of people won't listen. But the thing that struck me was this man lived in a rectory that literally overlooked the uh, Kings Bay uh, Inlet. And he possibly could see Trident submarines floating by, if not very close by. He knew they were there. And it never had occurred to him that the entire livelihood and economic well-being of the city where he was a shepherd was predicated on the end of the world. That's what Trident is. Trident is the end of the world. The Trident system can end life as we know it on planet at Earth. And, and so this is the case in all countries that are nuclear countries. Their governments tell the citizens the same thing. Don't worry. Mutually assured destruction will save us. So basically what citizens are being told in South Georgia and all through the United States and Canada and, and Russia and all the other countries that have nuclear arms is, don't worry. Mutually assured destruction, mutually assured destruction will last in perpetuity. And uh, essentially our nuclear weapons are just props. No one would use them because they know the, you know, the dangers of that. And of course, this, this argument that the policy of MAD can save us has really stuck. People believe this. People have now gotten to a point where living on 24-7 alert for total devastation of our planet has become normal. Nobody seems to want to resist that. And I'm thinking, you know, that 
in June 12th, 1982, uh, many people were in New York when 700,000 people marched against nuclear weapons on the United Nations. Uh, there was an awareness that we don't have now. For some reason, we have been lulled into some sense of buying into this huge lie that these weapons can save us, or at least keep us safe. Um, our job, you know, as, as, as workers for peace, to end, to end the climate, the, the climate change, to work to change uh, life as we know it on the planet so that we can survive and go on. So there'll be a life for my eight children and my two grandchildren. And we have 22 children among us, uh, the seven Kings Bay plowshares, uh, is that we can somehow reach people who believe that nuclear weapons are a normal part of life and also get people to sort of look at the military industrial complex with a critical eye. Uh, when Mark talks about this $1 trillion to, to make a whole new series of Trident submarines, where's the outrage? You don't hear anybody clamoring against this and people have bought into this. And so how do we develop mass resistance to this? And I guess maybe I'm hoping something can come out of the coronavirus that will wake people up to the fact that as a global family, we have to work together to resolve our problems and there's no room for war. There's no room for killing. There's no room for nuclear weapons. And none of those things have a right to exist and we have to do away with them. So my hope is that, uh, that we're beginning that path. And I, I have no idea if we are. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick.